Now turn the psalms of David Auer, and lilt why holy clangor, of double verse come G.I.E.S. 4, and skirl up the Bangor. Burns. The next was the important day, when, according to the forms and ritual of the Scottish Kirk, Reuben Butler was to be ordained minister of noctarlity, by the presbytery of. And so eager were the whole party, that all, excepting Mrs. Dutton, the destined cowslip of Inverary, were stirring at an early hour. Their host, whose appetite was as quick and keen as his temper, was not long in summoning them to a substantial breakfast, where there were at least a dozen of different preparations of milk, plenty of cold meat, scores boiled and roasted eggs, a huge keg of butter, half a firkin herrings boiled and broiled, fresh and salt, and tea and coffee for them that liked it, which, as their landlord assured them, with a nod and a wink, pointing, at the same time, to a little cutter which seemed dodging. Under the lee of the island, cost them little beside the fetching ashore. Is the contraband trade permitted here so openly, said Butler? I should think it very unfavorable to the people's morals. The Duke, Mr. Putler, has Jean Ney orders concerning the putting of it down, said the magistrate, and seemed to think that he had said all that was necessary to justify his connivance. Butler was a man of prudence, and aware that real good can only be obtained by remonstrance when remonstrance is well-timed, so for the present he said nothing more on the subject. When breakfast was half over, in flounced Mrs. Dolly, as fine as a blue sack K and cherry-colored ribbons could make her. Good morrow to you, madam, said the master of ceremonies, I trust your early rising will not scathe ye. The dame apologized to Captain Knockunder, as she was pleased to term their entertainer, but, as we say in Cheshire, she added, I was like the mayor of Altringham, who lies in bed while his breeches are mending, for the girl did not bring up the right bundle to my room, till she had brought up all the others by mistake one after t'other, well, I suppose we are all for church today, as I understand, pray may I be so bold as to ask, if it is the fashion for your north country gentlemen to go to church in your petticoats, Captain Knockunder? Captain of Knockdunder, madam, if you please, for I knock under to no man, and in respect of my garb, I shall go to church as I am, at your service, madam, for if I were to lie in bed like your major what do ye call em, till my preaches were mended, I might be there all my life, seeing I never had a pair of them on my person but twice in my life, which I am pound to remember, it peeing when the duke brought his duchess here, when her grace behoved to be pleasured, so I e'en poor the Minister's truce for the TWA days his grace was pleased to stay, but I will put myself under sick confinement again for no man on earth, or woman either, but her grace being always accepted, as in duty pound. The mistress of the milking pail stared but, making no answer to this round declaration, immediately proceeded to show, that the alarm of the preceding evening had in no degree injured her appetite. When the meal was finished, the captain proposed to them to take boat, in order that Mrs. Jeanie might see her new place of residence, and that he himself might inquire whether the necessary preparations had been made there, and at the manse, for receiving the future inmates of these mansions. The morning was delightful, and the huge mountain shadows slept upon the mirrored wave of the firth, almost as little disturbed as if it had been an inland lake. Even Mrs. Dutton's fears no longer annoyed her. She had been informed by Archibald that there was to be some sort of junketing after the sermon, and that was what she loved dearly, and as for the water, it was so still that it would look quite like a pleasuring on the Thames. The whole party being embarked, therefore, in a large boat, which the captain called his coach and six, and attended by a smaller one termed his gig, the gallant Duncan steered straight upon the little tower of the old-fashioned church of Noctarlity and the exertions of six stout rowers sped them rapidly on their voyage. As they neared the land, the hills appeared to recede from them, and a little valley, formed by the descent of a small river from the mountains, evolved itself as it were upon their approach. The style of the country on each side was simply pastoral, and resembled, in appearance and character, the description of a forgotten Scottish poet, which runs nearly thus. The water gently down a level slid, with little din, but cool I what it made, on Ilka side the trees grew thick and lang, and why the wild birds' notes were, in sang, on either side, a full bashot and mare, the green was even, Gowany, 
and fair, with easy slope on every hand the braze to the hill's feet with scattered bushes rays, with goats and sheep abun, and kai below, the bonny banks all in a swarm did go asterisk. Asterisk Ross's Fortunate Shepherdess. Edit. 1778, page 23. They landed in this highland Arcadia, at the mouth of the small stream which watered the delightful and peaceable valley. Inhabitants of several descriptions came to pay their respects to the captain of Nachtunder, a homage which he was very peremptory in exacting, and to see the new settlers. Some of these were men after David Deans's own heart, elders of the Kirk Session, zealous professors, from the Lennox, Lanarkshire, and Ayrshire, to whom the preceding Duke of Argyll had given rooms in this corner of his estate, because they had suffered for joining his father, the unfortunate Earl, during his ill-fated attempt in 1686. These were cakes of the right leaven for David regaling himself with, and, had it not been for this circumstance, he has been heard to say that the captain of Nachtunder would have swore him out of the country in twenty-four hours, say awesome it was to only thinking soul to hear his imprecations, upon the slightest temptation that crossed his humor. Besides these, there were a wilder set of parishioners, mountaineers from the upper glen and adjacent hill, who spoke Gaelic, went about armed, and wore the highland dress. But the strict commands of the duke had established such good order in this part of his territories, that the Gael and Saxons lived upon the best possible terms of good neighborhood. They first visited the manse, as the parsonage is termed in Scotland. It was old, but in good repair, and stood snugly embosomed in a grove of sycamore, with a well-stocked garden in front, bounded by the small river, which was partly visible from the windows, partly concealed by the bushes, trees, and bounding hedge. Within, the house looked less comfortable than it might have been, for it had been neglected by the late incumbent, but workmen had been laboring, under the directions of the captain of Nachtunder, and at the expense of the Duke of Argyll, to put it into some order. The old plenishing had been removed, and neat, but plain household furniture had been sent down by the Duke in a brig of his own called the Caroline, and was now ready to be placed in order in the apartments. The gracious Duncan, finding matters were at a stand among the workmen, summoned before him the delinquents, and impressed all who heard him with a sense of his authority, by the penalties with which he threatened them for their delay. Mulcting them in half their charge, he assured them, would be the least of it, for, if they were to neglect his pleasure in the dukes, he would be tanned if he paid them the t'other half either, and they might seek law for it where they could get it. The workpeople humbled themselves before the offended dignitary, and spake him soft and fair, and at length, upon Mr. Butler recalling to his mind that it was the ordination day, and that the workmen were probably thinking of going to church, knocked under agreed to forgive them, out of respect to their new minister. But and I catch them neglecting my duty again, Mr. Puddler, the teal P.E. in me if the Kirk shall be an excuse, for what has the like o' them rapparees to do with the Kirk only day put Sundays, or then either, if the Duke and I has the necessitous uses for them? It may be guessed with what feelings of quiet satisfaction and delight Butler looked forward to spending his days, honored and useful as he trusted to be, in this sequestered valley, and how often an intelligent glance was exchanged betwixt him and Jeanie, whose good-humored face looked positively handsome, from the expression of modesty, and, at the same time, of satisfaction, which she wore when visiting the apartments of which she was soon to call herself mistress. She was left at liberty to give more open indulgence to her feelings of delight and admiration, when, leaving the manse, the company proceeded to examine the destined habitation of David Deans. Jeanie found with pleasure that it was not above a musket shot from the manse, for it had been a bar to her happiness to think she might be obliged to reside at a distance from her father, and she was aware that there were strong objections to his actually living in the same house with Butler. But this brief distance was the very thing which she could have wished. The farmhouse was on the plan of an improved cottage, and contrived with great regard to convenience, an excellent little garden, an orchard, and a set of offices complete, according to the best ideas of the time, combined to render it a most desirable habitation for the practical farmer, and far superior to the hovel at Woodend, and the small house at St. Leonard's Crags. The situation was considerably higher than that of the manse, and fronted to the west. The windows commanded an enchanting view of the little vale over which the mansion seemed to preside, the windings of the stream, and the firth, 
with its associated lakes and romantic islands. The hills of Dumbartonshire, once possessed by the fierce clan of Macfarlands, formed a crescent behind the valley, and far to the right were seen the dusky and more gigantic mountains of Argyllshire, with a seaward view of the shattered and thunder-splitten peaks of Arran. But to Jeanie, whose taste for the picturesque, if she had any by nature, had never been awakened or cultivated, the sight of the faithful old May Hetley, as she opened the door to receive them in her clean toy, Sunday's russet gown, and blue apron, nicely smoothed down before her, was worth the whole varied landscape. The raptures of the faithful old creature at seeing Jeanie were equal to her own, as she hastened to assure her, that both the goodman and the beasts had been as well seen after as she possibly could contrive. Separating her from the rest of the company, May then hurried her young mistress to the offices, that she might receive the compliments she expected for her care of the cows. Jeanie rejoiced, in the simplicity of her heart, to see her charge once more, and the mute favorites of our heroine, Gowans, and the others, acknowledged her presence by lowing, turning round their broad and decent brows when they heard her well-known pro, my lady, pro, my woman, and, by various indications, known only to those who have studied the habits of the milky mothers, showing sensible pleasure as she approached to caress them in their turn. The very brute beasts are glad to see ye again, said May, but nay wonder, Jeanie, for ye were I kind of beast in body. And I maun learn to see ye mistress now, Jeanie, since ye hae been up to Lunnon, and seen the duke, and the king, and it the braw folk. But wa cans, added the old dame slyly, what I'll hae to see ye for by mistress, for I am thinking it one a Langby Deans. See me your ain genie, May, and then ye can never gang rang. In the cowhouse which they examined, there was one animal which Jeanie looked at till the tears gushed from her eyes. May, who had watched her with a sympathizing expression, immediately observed, in an undertone, the good amun I sorts that beast himself, and is kinder to it than ony beast in the byre, and I noticed he was that way e'en when he was angriest, and had maist cause to be angry at, at sirs. A parent's heart's a queer thing, mony a warsel he has had for that poor lassie, I am thinking he petitions mare for her than for yourself, hinny, for what can he plead for you but just to wish you the blessing ye deserve? And when I sleep at I the Hallen, when we came first here, he was often earnest at night, and I could hear him come hour and hour again why, Effie, poor blinded misguided thing, it was I Effie. Effie. If that poor wandering lamb come on it into the sheepfold in the shepherd's eye time, it will be an uncle wonder for I what she has been a child of prayers. Oh, if the poor prodigal wad return, essay e blithely as the goodman wad kill the fatted calf, though Brocky's calf will no be fit for killing this three weeks yet. And then, with the discursive talent of persons of her description, she got once more afloat in her account of domestic affairs, and left this delicate and affecting topic. Having looked at everything in the offices and the dairy, and expressed her satisfaction with the manner in which matters had been managed in her absence, Jeanie rejoined the rest of the party, who were surveying the interior of the house, all excepting David Deans and Butler, who had gone down to the church to meet the Kirk Session and the clergyman of the Presbytery, and arrange matters for the duty of the day. In the interior of the cottage all was clean, neat, and suitable to the exterior. It had been originally built and furnished by the Duke, as a retreat for a favorite domestic of the higher class, who did not long enjoy it, and had been dead only a few months, so that everything was in excellent taste and good order. But in Jeanie's bedroom was a neat trunk, which had greatly excited Mrs. Dutton's curiosity, for she was sure that the direction, for Mrs. Jean Deans, at Ochingower, parish of Noctarlity, was the writing of Mrs. Semple, the Duchess's own woman. May Hetley produced the key in a sealed parcel, which bore the same address, and attached to the key was a label, intimating that the trunk and its contents were a token of remembrance to Jeanie Deans, from her friends the Duchess of Argyle and the young ladies. The trunk, hastily opened, as the reader will not doubt, was found to be full of wearing apparel of the best quality, suited to Jeanie's rank in life, and to most of the articles the names of the particular donors were attached, as if to make Jeanie sensible not only of the general, but of the individual interest she had excited in the noble family. To name the various articles by their appropriate names, would be to attempt things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme, besides that the old-fashioned terms of mantos, sacks, kissing strings, and so forth, 
would convey but little information even to the milliners of the present day. I shall deposit, however, an accurate inventory of the contents of the trunk with my kind friend, Miss Martha Buskbody, who has promised, should the public curiosity seem interested in the subject, to supply me with a professional glossary and commentary. Suffice it to say, that the gift was such as became the donors, and was suited to the situation of the receiver, that everything was handsome and appropriate, and nothing forgotten which belonged to the wardrobe of a young person in genie's situation in life, the destined bride of a respectable clergyman. Article after article was displayed, commented upon, and admired, to the wonder of May, who declared, she didn't think the queen had mare or better clays, and somewhat to the envy of the northern cowslip. This unamiable, but not very unnatural, disposition of mind, broke forth in sundry unfounded criticisms to the disparagement of the articles, as they were severally exhibited. But it assumed a more direct character, when, at the bottom of all, was found a dress of white silk, very plainly made, but still of white silk, and French silk to boot, with a paper pinned to it, bearing that it was a present from the Duke of Argyle to his travelling companion, to be worn on the day when she should change her name. Mrs. Dutton could forbear no longer, but whispered into Mr. Archibald's ear, that it was a clever thing to be a Scotchwoman, she supposed all her sisters, and she had half a dozen, might have been hanged, without anyone sending her a present of a pocket handkerchief. Or without your making any exertion to save them, Mrs. Dolly, answered Archibald Drilliot, but I am surprised we do not hear the bell yet, said he, looking at his watch. Fat ta deal, Mr. Archibald, answered the captain of Knockdunder, wad ye hae them ring the bell before I am ready to gang to Kirk, I wad gar the beadrill eat the bell rope, if he took ony sick freedom. But if ye want to hear the bell, I will just show missile on the knowhead, and it will begin jowing forthwith. Accordingly, so soon as they sallied out, and that the gold-laced hat of the captain was seen rising like Hesper above the dewy verge of the rising ground, the clash, for it was rather a clash than a clang, of the bell was heard from the old moss-grown tower, and the clapper continued to thump its crack sides all the while they advanced towards the kirk, Duncan exhorting them to take their own time, for teal only sport wad be till he came. Asterisk Asterisk no t, tolling to service in Scotland. Accordingly, the bell only changed to the final and impatient chime when they crossed the stile, and rang in, that is, concluded its mistuned summons, when they had entered the duke's seat, in the little kirk, where the whole party arranged themselves, with Duncan at their head, excepting David Deans, who already occupied his seat among the elders. The business of the day, with a particular detail of which it is unnecessary to trouble the reader, was gone through according to the established form, and the sermon pronounced upon the occasion had the good fortune to please even the critical David Deans, though it was only an hour and a quarter long, which David termed a short allowance of spiritual provender. The preacher, who was a divine that held many of David's opinions, privately apologized for his brevity by saying, that he observed the captain was gaunting grievously, and that if he had detained him longer, there was no knowing how long he might be in paying the next term's vital stipend. David groaned to find that such carnal motives could have influence upon the mind of a powerful preacher. He had, indeed, been scandalized by another circumstance during the service. So soon as the congregation were seated after prayers, and the clergyman had read his text, the gracious Duncan, after rummaging the leathern purse which hung in front of his petticoat, produced a short tobacco pipe made of iron, and observed, almost aloud, I hae forgotten my splookin' Lachlan, gang down to the clockin, and bring me up a pennyworth of twist. Six arms, the nearest within reach, presented, with an obedient start, as many tobacco pouches to the man of office. He made choice of one with a nod of acknowledgement, filled his pipe, lighted it with the assistance of his pistol flint, and smoked with infinite composure during the whole time of the sermon. When the discourse was finished, he knocked the ashes out of his pipe, replaced it in his sporin, returned the tobacco pouch or spluck into its owner, and joined in the prayer with decency and attention. The Captain of Knockdunder At the end of the service, when Butler had been admitted minister of the Kirk of Noctarlity, 
with all its spiritual immunities and privileges, David, who had frowned, groaned, and murmured at knocked under his irreverent demeanor, communicated his plain thoughts of the matter to Isaac Michael Hose, one of the elders, with whom a reverential aspect and huge grizzle wig had especially disposed him to seek fraternization. It didn't become a wild Indian, David said, much less a Christian, and a gentleman, to sit in the kirk puffing tobacco reek, as if he were in a change house. Michael Ho shook his head, and allowed it was far fray beseeming, but what will ye say? The captain's a queer hand, and to speak to him about that or anything else that crosses the maggot, wad be to set the kilne low. He keeps a high hand o'er the country, and we couldn't a deal wide the highlandman without his protection, sin o' the keys o' the kintre hangs at his belt, and he's no an ill body in the main, and maestery, he can, maws the meadows down. That may be very true, neighbor, said David, but Reuben Butler isna the man I take him to be, if he disna learn the captain to fuff his pipe some other gate than in God's house, or the quarter be our. Fair and softly gangs far, said Michael Hose, and if a fuel may gie a wise man a counsel, I wad hae him think twice or he mells with knocked under, he old hae a langshank it's that wad's up kale why the deal. But they are away to their dinner to the change house, and if we didn't amend our pace, we'll come short at mealtime. David accompanied his friend without answer, but began to feel from experience that the Glen of Noctarlity, like the rest of the world, was haunted by its own special subjects of regret and discontent. His mind was so much occupied by considering the best means of converting Duncan of Noct to a sense of reverend decency during public worship, that he altogether forgot to inquire whether Butler was called upon to subscribe the oaths to government. Some have insinuated that his neglect on this head was, in some degree, intentional, but I think this explanation inconsistent with the simplicity of my friend David's character. Neither have I ever been able, by the most minute inquiries, to know whether the formula, at which he so much scrupled, had been exacted from Butler, I or no. The books of the Kirk Session might have thrown some light on this matter, but unfortunately they were destroyed in the year 1746, by one Donacha Dhu Nadune, at the instance, it was said, or at least by the connivance, of the gracious Duncan of Knock, who had a desire to obliterate the recorded foibles of a certain Kate Finlayson.